Well, good morning, and uh, thank you, David. I certainly appreciate the youthful looks uh, compliment. I must, that's been recorded, right? I can take that home to my wife and say, see, um, I've still got it. Um, no, it is a pleasure to be here. It certainly beats having breakfast with my two-year-old flinging porridge at me. Um, usually around this time, I'm sort of ducking and diving to avoid what's coming my way. So if I do flinch and duck and dive, then you'll know that it's just an automatic response usually at this time of the morning. I do love Christmas. It is a wonderful time of the year. Um, that is a tune that you'll be whistling sometime later on today. At some point, it's in your head now. But I love the tinsel. I love the trees. I love the presents. I love the quality streets. I love everything about it. I particularly love it these days because I have three kids under six at home. And seeing and experiencing uh, Christmas through, through their little eyes, their wee understandings of what's going on is, is always a delight. Uh, you've all probably old enough to have heard the analogy that if, if life can be set up according to Santa stages, then there are four stages to life. Number one, you believe in Santa and then you don't believe in Santa, and then you become Santa, and then you end up looking like Santa. <laughs> so I'm in that third stage where I'm Santa these days. My kids are still in the first stage. They believe in Santa, and they're looking forward to his arrival. I'll let you classify where you're at or where the guy sitting beside you is at. I'm not going to go there. Uh, but my kids love it, and my six-year-old can't wait until Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. My four-year-old's a little bit suspicious. I mean, he's right. Big, fat, hairy guys dressed in weird suits are suspect, but he just follows her lead. He just gets excited when she gets excited. He opens his advent calendar uh, when she opens it. He loves it, but he's a little bit suspicious. The two-year-old, he's another uh, beast altogether. He, he's confused, uh, but he's joyful. He's loving it, and he's highly distracted, and he's easily led. He woke up one morning. We brought him down to the living room, and there the living room was, had exploded with a whole bunch of little cuddlies, little snowmen, little reindeers, a tree, tinsel. And so he's just exploring the living room with sort of a new uh, lease on life. And he's only two. My job these days is to stop him from sort of flinging stuff at his sister and poking little legs off the reindeers. But it's beautiful to see life through their eyes, certainly the two-year-olds. He reminded me of the little boy who, who was confused about Christmas too, and he got on his knees and he was praying to God, and he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy, thy name. Thy kingdom come. And then he got to the forgive us our uh, trespasses bit. And he says, forgive us our Christmases as we forgive those who Christmas against us. I, I love that. Every year I think of that. And certainly these years as I watch my little ones experience what's going on with all the distractions, I remember that. And I laugh. Forgive us our Christmases as we forgive those who Christmas against us. You see, Christmas is filled with stuff that we don't usually see the rest of the year. Certainly not in that way. Different types of food, different types of decorations, different types of, of lights, different events that we go to. There's, there's even a different spirit in the air. They're all little distractions to, to the everyday life, to the common life that we experience the rest of the year. Uh, it's easy to go through Christmas with somewhat of a daze, albeit a joyful daze, smiling uh, as you hum carols, and go from event to event, or from church service to church service, or even from shop to shop. Being led here and there by all the, all the marketing and advertising gimmicks that get people to spend. Stuff that shrewd business persons have thought up. No offense, right? So, so I love it. I, I, it reminds me as well that, that we are easily led and that, that Christmas is a time of joy and confusion and multiple distractions. And so we do spend, we, we, we do what Christmas encourages us to do these days because it is so commercial, which is spend. My understanding and something I read recently was that 20% of all retail sales in the US occur in the week or week and a half leading up to Christmas. That's a lot of buying at Christmas time. Christmas has become very, very commercial. Just to prove to you that you also are easily led even though as business people you are good at leading other people to buy a good product, don't get me wrong, I wanted to do a little experiment with you. And you may have heard it before, but we're gonna do it anyway. It has worked every other time I've done it, so if it doesn't work today, you're all strange. 
<laughs> so, uh, I want you to think of a number between two and nine. Right, you got that number. Then I want you to multiply that number by nine. I know, it's getting complicated. Take another swig of that coffee. Uh, number between two and nine, then multiply that number by nine. You should end up with a, a number that has two digits. I want you to treat those two digits as single numbers and add them together. And then I want you to subtract five from that. You should end up with a number. Now, if A equals one and B equals two and C equals three and D equals four, etc., I want you to find the corresponding alphabetical letter to that number. Okay, you, you, got, you got it? Now, I want you to think of a country that begins with, whose name begins with that letter. Now I want you to take the second letter in the name of that country and I want you to think of an, an animal. Right, got it? I want you to think of the color of that animal. Now I want, hands up, all of you who are thinking of a gray elephant from Denmark. <laughs> yeah, probably a little lower than the usual statistics. Uh, some smart Alex end up thinking of the Dominican Republic, which is sort of the un only other sort of country that we know of that starts with D. But see, you're very, very easily led. As human beings, we can be very easily led, particularly when you're distracted with unusual things going on around you. To think strange thoughts. Right? Gray elephants from Denmark, who thinks of that? And more importantly in the business world, to do something with what you have thought, right? Usually to purchase something. Well, Christmas is, is, is no different really for many. And that's why my two-year-old reminds me of a lot of people at Christmas time. Confused, joyful, hopping from uh, object to object, highly distracted, being easily led to part with hard-earned money that we struggle to part you with the rest of the year. Uh, that being said, what I want to do for a few moments this morning is focus you. Just for a few moments, snap you out of the days, um, get your attention for a little while, perhaps the only time of this year that you'll think of Christ, perhaps the only Christmas of any year that you've ever thought of Christ, I want to insert for a few moments Christ back into your Christmas. I mean, the name Christmas bears his name. It is all about him. And, and here's the thing. Christ is in your Christmas. Your living room is pointing you toward him. There's an angel there. There's a star there. There's a tree there. There's usually a manger there with a little baby Jesus in it. There are Christmas cards that have lines out of the carols that sing praises to him. And Christ is all over your Christmas, but might not be much... Uh, in your thoughts, this Christmas, any Christmas, I, I find that a bit of a tragedy. So for a few moments, I want to insert Christ back into your Christmas. Now, I'm doing a lot of speaking this weekend. Uh, tomorrow, I have a wedding. And, and I know what I'm going to say at a wedding, right? I'm going to tell him to love her. I'm going to tell her not to get mad at him. I'm going to tell him to make sure he doesn't look at other women. And I'm going to tell her not to get mad at him. Then I'm going to tell him to keep the toilet seat down, and then I'm going to tell her to stop getting mad at him. It's, it's quite easy when it comes to a wedding. He has to do some things. She has to do some things. And then I'm speaking on Sunday morning at a church, and that one's easy too, because I'm going to give them last year's Christmas message, which has made this week quite hard, because I spoke at the same event last year. I only have one Christmas message. So they're going to get it on Sunday. But today I've had to think quite hard about what I'm going to say to you given you got my one and only Christmas message last year, at least those of you who were here. As I thought about that, uh, as I've thought about how do I tell you what Christmas is all about, what, what Christ is all about essentially, particularly at Christmas, how do I do that, but in a different way? I came up with a, a different story that had come across uh, my desk at some point, and I thought that if I told you that story, that I'd let you connect the dots. You're smart people. You're easily led, I've seen that. I'm going to lead you to connect the dots. But to personalize it. Because Christ has a lot to say at Christmas to you, not to everybody else, to you. And you may have missed him every other Christmas. But I want to know that for at least a few moments this Christmas, he'll be on your radar. Uh, you've probably heard uh, of the story of a lady called Helen Keller. 
as I said earlier, it came across uh, my life quite recently. I'd heard the name, never explored it. Wonderful story. This is a, a girl who was born in 1880 into quite a comfortable, quite a prosperous family in Alabama, the USA. Uh, she, by just before the age of two, that's the age my wee boys, you know, at home, the one who flings porridge at me, that's his age. At the age of two, she got very, very ill. Extremely ill, in fact, uh, she developed what doctors at the time could only classify as a brain fever. They didn't know what it was, but they knew it affected her uh, brain in some capacity, and so she had a brain fever. Uh, she woke up, she survived from it, but she never saw again. She was blind, completely blind. And she never heard again. She was completely deaf. And she hadn't learned to speak. She wasn't even two, so she was completely mute. Shut out from the outside world. Trapped inside a very, very dark, a very, very silent, and one can only imagine a very, very confusing and lonely world. Not even two. Her parents, as you can imagine, did all that they could to try and help their little girl, but money couldn't fix her problem. All the comforts that they could provide for her could not fix her situation. It was recommended that she be institutionalized because she'd act out. And you can only imagine the desperation she was in as a little two-year-old, as a little three-year-old, as a little four-year-old. It's dark, it's silent. Uh, what's out there? I can't even communicate. Uh, a few years later, when she was four, five, six, seven, somewhere in that range, her parents brought another young lady into their home called Annie. And Annie was partially blind herself. And what Annie uh, tried to do was reach into her wee world, cut through into her darkness, try and communicate the outside within her so that they could communicate and they could relate and she could develop she tried for years and to no success, so much so that Helen's older stepbrother advised Annie to just let it be. Let her be. Let her go. It's, it's pointless. It's hopeless. We lose. She loses. Annie must have been quite a tough nut because she wouldn't let go. The story goes that one night she went into little Helen's room she watched her sleep. She knelt down beside her wee bed, so close to her wee face she could feel the breath of Helen blow into her face, and she whispered into her wee ear, I won't let go. I'm not going to let go. I won't let go. God's world is not to be missed. I won't let you just be. I'm going to show you it. I won't let go. You're worth too much to me to let go. What a remarkable lady. That, in essence, what, what Annie has done, in essence, is the Christmas story. Connect the dots. Christmas is about God not letting go of you who live in and sometimes love the darkness. He won't let go. The Bible teaches us, the Bible teaches me what I know in my own heart, that something's not right. That despite the tinsel and the trees and the presents and the giving and, the, uh, and, and all the distractions and all the lights and all the stuff I love at Christmas, that, that something is not right. That all those pleasurable distractions are temporary. That beyond that, I have a fever in my heart and you have a fever in your heart and the world is ill and it isn't the way it should have been. We know that. That's what the Bible teaches and your experience testifies to it too. Uh, we have food, you have food, you get lovely breakfast, you probably have breakfast tomorrow morning. You have a nice home, it's probably warm, you've got nice perks, nice luxuries, you have fun, you enjoy life. You might even get a nice jumper this Christmas, I don't know. But money can't fix your problem, my friend. Money can't solve that fever that you have in your heart. And getting to the end of life with the most stuff and with the most money in your bank account, isn't a win. Isn't victory in life. Isn't success. 
The Bible teaches us as well that, that God is the only one who can solve your heart's problem. And here's the beauty of it. He does. He is willing. He stoops down, kneels down, closes in close by and whispers into your face, into your ear, into your heart. He becomes a man because that's the way to solve man's problems, your problem. He even puts on nappies to clean up your mess. He could have done it in, in a different manner. God could have imposed himself on mankind and said, now you will submit to me given who I am, but where would the love relationship develop from that? You would all submit to him out of fear, not out of love. So he comes in the most humbling of ways as a baby. And he does change everything, just as we heard this morning. God takes on flesh to whisper into your ear, I will not let you go. You want me to let go. I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you just be in the situation that you're in. I love you too much. There's a world and a life with me that I want you to experience because I love you even when you reject me. That's, that's the message of Christmas. That's the Christ in Christmas. That's, that's what Christianity affirms about the Lord Jesus Christ, despite the tinsel, despite the lights, despite the shopping, despite the quality streets, albeit all of that I love. Christmas is God showing up when he didn't have to, to fix your problem, and your problem is with him. So only he can fix it. The story continues some years after uh, Annie had been working with Helen, um, trying everything to break into her wee life. She took her outside and she took her over to a wee water pump. She put her hand under the water pump and let the cold water go onto her hand. And she grabbed her other hand, flipped over to her palm, and on it wrote W-A-T-E-R, water. She did it again, hand in the water pump, other hand, W-A-T-E-R, water. And she did it again, W-A-T-E-R, water. W-A-T-E-R, water. After I don't know how long, Helen pulled back, jerked, shrieked in her own wee way, grabbed, groped for Annie's hand, put it under the water, and spelt out Nanny's palm, W-A-T-E-R, water. Annie had broken in. Annie got in there because she persisted, because she cared, because she loved, because she saw value in Helen, in Helen's distress. The outside world got in. Now, if you go on to read Helen Keller's story, it is a remarkable story. This little girl goes on to do amazing things and is one of the most remarkable women ever to have walked the planet. Only died in, in 1961. Remarkable lady, but so was Annie. He stuck with her. Uh, friends, Christmas tells us that God is breaking into our dark world and that he has a message to communicate to us. And, and it's a message of love. And, 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 you know, he's not bound to offer it to us. He doesn't have to. He's not dependent upon our affection. But he loves us. He loves you. I can't say it any better than the most famous verse in the Bible says it. You know the verse that a lot of Christian nuts sort of put on placards at sporting events, usually in the corners to catch the camera? John 3.16. The reason they do that is because John 3.16 is a remarkable verse. A beautiful summary and one little spot of what God is doing. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God so loved you in your rebellion against him that he did what only he could do. He gave, and he gave himself. He stooped down, he drew close, he whispered into your heart that he doesn't want you to perish, that he wants you to have L-I-F-E, life, eternal life. And that that's possible if you'd be E-L-I-E-V-E. -E. Now, that's getting complicated. Believe. 
that you just believe. He's made it as, as easy as possible for you to have life with him in a world that you were supposed to experience. But we messed up. We screwed up. Uh, Christmas is about giving. It really is. It's about God giving you who have everything what your everything cannot buy, what your everything cannot fix, your heart fever. God is about giving you himself. It's about giving you forgiveness. Who doesn't want to be forgiven? I do. I mess up all the time. And I know it's not right. Who doesn't want to have hope? I do. I want to know that if tonight I put my head on the pillow and never wake again and come before God, that I'll be okay. That he'll recognize me of one of his. Not someone who spent life just going through life, doing good stuff and rejecting him. I want all of that. And all of that is available if you just B-E-L-I-E-V-E, believe. Now here's the thing. The Bible tells us that uh, believe is of a certain kind. It's not just believe in the sense that, oh yeah, I believe Jesus lived. Oh yeah, I believe Jesus was God, full stop. No, no, the Bible says that even demons believe that Jesus was God and they, and they tremble in fear because they recognize the implications of that. No, the belief that receives God's invitation to you is a belief that essentially means you trust. That you get on your knees, you bow the knee as we sang about this morning and you recognize that you have a heart fever and that you can't fix it. And that you must plunge yourself into his mercy and receive his salvation on his terms because he's provided a way in the Lord Jesus Christ. The debt's been paid. It's just needing to be put into your account. You get to do that. That's the Christmas story, my friends. It's, it's as simple as that. Uh, that's enough, I believe, for you to consider. Yeah, we've been here a wee while. Uh, I know some of you... Uh, uh, are interested and see, here's what I want you to do. I, I want you all to bow your heads and close your eyes out of respect for the guy beside you. I know some of you are uninterested and some of you will continue distracted and some of you are suspicious, but some of you are interested. And so for their sake, I want you to all to bow your head, close your eyes and just think for a few moments. What I do know is that you're all going to leave this room this Christmas informed about the invitation that God makes to you and a decision that you have to make, be it rejection or acceptance. What I do want you to understand is that your success, again, can't fix your problem, that only God can. And that he came, came on that first Christmas because he is willing to fix your problem. He's available to you, but only on his terms. Here's the thing, what God offers you is not up for negotiation. You don't get to negotiate the terms of this deal. You don't get to boss him about. He's the boss. You know, Helen herself became a Christian later on in life, and when she spoke of her encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, she said this, I knew he was always there in my darkness. I just didn't know his name. Well, you know his name. His name is Jesus Christ. And he's whispering into your heart, I don't want to let go of you. I don't want to let go. I will let go, but I don't want to let go. Life isn't framed according to our belief in Santa, believe it or not. That shouldn't shock you. It is framed according to what you do with Jesus Christ. Whether you believe in him or you reject him. That will determine your eternal destiny, the Bible teaches. I beg that you see to it that you would sort of navigate through all the distractions and all the gimmicks of Christmas and find time to focus your attention on him. To give him a few moments to consider his invitation. It is not compulsion. God is not forcing you to submit to him. You get to choose what to do with God, but you will get what you choose. I'd encourage you to call out in your own heart even now or at some point today or at some point this week, at some point this Christmas. Bow your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask him to forgive you and lean on his mercy and believe. Do, do what we do best at Christmas is 
which is receive a gift. God's gift. And when you do so, then just live a grateful life. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for these moments this morning. We thank you for this breakfast. What a breakfast. We thank you for this group of men and women who love you so much and love the people sitting beside them so much that they want to engage with you. They want their peers to engage with you. Father, I pray that you would uh, hound these people today, this Christmas, that you would whisper into their ears that you love them, that they would uh, be confronted with a decision that they have to make. I ask, Lord, that you would move in their hearts, that they would get on their knees and, and confess the Lord Jesus Christ as, as their Lord, that they would put their hope in him and in him alone, Again, thank you for these moments. We're grateful to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.